I am able to speak. All right, everybody, let's get started. Should I be a little louder? All right, everybody, welcome to the okay. Everybody, uh, welcome to the MTV Angular Meetup for June. Your regularly scheduled host, Steven, is in Japan, so you're stuck with me today, unfortunately. Uh, we got a pretty cool setup for you today. Uh, we'll do a couple of quick announcements, some stuff you might have missed. Uh, and then Hans from the CLI team is going to come up and talk about schematics, which is some new build tooling we're going to be uh, releasing for some pretty awesome use cases. And then Oswaldo is going to come up and talk about deep learning, how to use it with Angular, how Angular sort of applies to it. It's going to be way, way above my head, so I'm going to sit and listen more than the rest of you. So announcements. Uh, you might have seen Angular 4.2 came out uh, sort of Friday through Monday as we release various copies of it and various versions of it. A um, bunch of new features. Everything is obviously smaller, faster, better. But in general, this is the big one that everybody was waiting for. So the new animations API has finally landed in 4.2. Um, this builds on the existing animation support that exists in Angular, uh, but adds a couple of really cool features. The big one is query, and query allows you to basically query for child elements and then programmatically animate them. The big thing that opens up for everybody and probably like the most requested feature in Angular so far has been animations on route changes. So we've got a really, really nice API to make that work. Uh, that also works with reusable animations. So you'll be able to you know, go ahead and define a really complex animation, package that up, put it on NPM and share it with the world and people can just plug it into their Angular applications. I'd love to see if anybody's looking for a project, somebody builds sort of an animations route or an animations library for the router, so you could share that out and people could plug it in. That would be a pretty cool thing with free open source to build. Um, it opens up a player API as well, so now you can have kind of complete programmatic control of animations rather than just doing it in the declarative fashion you do today. It means you can play them and pause them and you can scrub through timelines and do all kinds of really, really cool things. Uh, if you haven't seen what it looks like, I'm not going to take credit for this demo because it's an amazing demo. Uh, Matthias did this for NGConf, if you haven't seen it. So uh, this is the new animations API, or this is a demo built using it. So you get really nice, smooth animations, which I think work. So these are, uh, this is kind of standard animations that are working inside of the page. And then down at the bottom here, I'm actually, I've got a, a couple of routes. So if I go from this home page to the about page, you'll see it actually animates all of these things out, slides all the stuff out, and then kind of animates stuff back in. Uh, so this is really, really cool. This is pretty straightforward to do, actually, and way, way easier than it is to do in vanilla DOM. Um, so Matthias' website, Year of Moo, has got some pretty cool demos. I'll put a link up at the end of the talk for that. Um, but pull it down, start playing with it, and it, again, it would be really cool to see reusable animations libraries. So that's something if you're interested in, reach out to me on Twitter or send me an email or whatever, and I'd love to chat about it. Uh, the other big thing we did this week was actually release the new version of Angular.io, our website. Um, if you pay attention on Reddit sometimes, you see the occasional comment where people sort of say, but the Angular website is written in AngularJS. Not anymore, we've released it. It's now a full Angular app. Uh, Woohoo! Uh, <laughs> I didn't actually do anything on it, so appreciate the applause. Uh, so it's a progressive web app. This is great, right? Um, if you play with it, you'll notice that it actually installs a service worker, so it should work offline. Uh, not all these things work perfectly. We're still kind of working through a couple of different things, but uh, it should work offline. It should be incredibly fast. I've seen just tons of comments about it being really, really quick, which is awesome. Um, 
we're using our new service worker tooling. So we're actually dog fooding our new service worker library we're going to release to the world uh, in our own website first, which is probably a good idea. Uh, so this is being developed. This does things like static content caching and uh, does dynamic content caching. Uh, we'll do push messaging, opens up all the various things you can do with service worker. So we're testing that, uh, the kind of 4.2 early release of it on angular.io, and we hope to release that with 4.3 eventually. Uh, you can pull it down and start playing with it, though. We'd love feedback on it. If service workers is something you've played with, pull it down, play with it, try it out. Again, we'd love, love feedback on it. Uh, the other thing I want to call out just in the vein of PWAs and fast websites. Um, so Hussein, and I'm not even going to try to do his last name. So Hussein, if you're watching this from home, I'm really sorry. I'm not going to butcher your last name. Uh, he's been working on this Angular 2 Hacker News app uh, for quite a long time. Like he's been working on it for almost a year, I think. Um, and it turns out that sort of the rest of the community has as well been working on these uh, these Hacker News to do MVP replacement apps. So Hussein's been working on a really cool one. Uh, you should check it out on his GitHub. So it's GitHub.com/slash/HusseinDujerj. Uh, yeah, sorry, Hussein. Um, and Jeff Cross, who used to work on the Angular team, now works for Narwhal. Uh, he's been tweaking and playing with this app, and kind of we're using it as a good test case to learn better patterns to improve the loading performance of these apps. So I have a link to it here. Up, if I can actually click through. Actually, click through that. So uh, again, like this is a this is a really nice thing to get a look at just to get a feel for what a fast application feels like, how it's assembled together, how it uses service worker, how it does content caching, all these things that are quite difficult to do uh, if you've never done it before. Uh, Hussein's app is a really really good one to to kind of look through and get a feel for how these things work together. So check that out and and big shit big shout out to Hussein on that. Uh, 1.1 of the CLI came out since the last version, since the last meetup a couple months ago. Uh, no major changes in that pond, nothing major. Oh right, yeah, so there's a, a slightly more, a slightly improved kind of uh, basic homepage when you create a new application, uh, obviously bug fixes, all those kinds of things. So CLI will stay stable, 1.2, which is effective just once. Uh, A couple of weeks, we should see Angular CLI 1.2. Um, so I'm going to bring Hans up to the stage. Hans is going to talk today about schematics. I'll let him do a deeper introduction. But in general, it's a, uh, a new build tooling we're going to use to actually form the basis of a lot of generation tooling. I'm just going to shut up and let Hans talk about it. Let's do that. I'll just let Hans talk about it. Have your own laptop, expert? Yeah. Give it up for Hans. One, two, one, two, everybody can hear me? Yeah, awesome. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Hans, and apparently I can't plug a laptop. <laughs> I'm a software expert. This is a hardware problem. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm the lead on the CLI, and um, we are uh, working uh, towards making like a lot of new features and one of these features that we're working is schematics and what is schematics well basically it's a custom uh, templates and custom uh, scaffolding for the CLI um, yay <laughs> thank you everybody um, so basically what is schematics schematics is a is a generation tool that can transform an existing file system it can create rename delete files Overwrite files. I mean, the, the the usual thing that you can do with something like uh, YoMam, but this one is different because um, it's descriptive. It's not necessarily imperative. Imperative. So if there is an error that happens in the middle of your uh, scaffolding, for example, uh, you will not actually change the file system. And this is really a property that we're trying to enforce at all state at, at all layers. And this is really important because. I don't know how many of you actually used complex YoMam, but I've used like really complex YoMam. And at some point, you just do a human stuff, and it worked the day before. Now it doesn't work, and you end up with a Git repo that's just weird and complicated, and you have to revert everything. And then, anyway, it's a mess. So, and it's fully typed. Uh, in the inputs uh, are verifiable, so we do check everything. If there is a required input, the schematics itself is not even aware of that, and we check it for them. Um, and it's fully typed because it's in TypeScript. 
so you guys can use the type system in TypeScript and build against uh, schematics to verify that uh, you're using it right. Um, also, it's a transform transformation pipeline. It starts from an existing tree, what we call a tree. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. And it output basically another tree. So it's just transformative. It's a, it's a classic pipeline kind of structure. Uh, the trees have a root, which is a starting set of files. And uh, you apply a list of actions to it. Uh, and in that sense, it, it kind of goes like a little bit like Git, where you have basically a working file system, and then you make a list of changes that you stage, and then you commit it uh, on the file system at the end of your workflow. Um, so some terms, I'm gonna go through these a little bit quickly. Uh, collection, uh, it's a map of uh, names uh, to schematics. Uh, it, in the CLI, it's going to be an NPM package, so you guys can act, will be able to publish some of them and use collection of schematics and reuse other collections of schematics. Um, and the schematics itself is the generator, so we'll see later what it means. A tree is just a series of files uh, that contains a path and uh, content itself. Um, a source is basically something, a function that generates, that takes nothing and generates a tree. A rule is something that takes a tree and generate another tree. And as you can see, I've been talking about this, schematics are basically a rule uh, that are applied to an existing tree, which is normally the file system from the start. And an action is something that's atomic, like creation, renaming, overwriting, and deletion of files. Um, so, as an example, the root is the actual file system that you work from, and then you apply five actions, in this, in this case, to create a rename to overwrite, and that becomes your staging uh, spot. And this is kind of important, but we'll not, won't get into it. So yeah, and the commit is performed at the end. The schematics doesn't even see the file system. It doesn't know if it commits in memory. It can commit in another server. Uh, the person developing the schematics does not even uh, know where it's gonna end, it just describes what it's gonna do. Uh, and a schematics can use other schematics as well. I'm going through these really fast because once, like these are kind of like high con concepts, but once I, once we go into the code a little bit later, uh, you'll see that this is, well actually, hey look, my slides are done. Um, so we'll go into the code and I'll show you a little bit of what, how to create a schematics, how to use it with uh, what we do as a reference. Uh, we just have a reference CLI right now. Uh, the next steps are gonna be to integrate that reference CLI with the actual um, Angular CLI. But in the meantime, so, so I'm gonna show you some uh, part of it. So if I do schematics here, this is the reference CLI that we use internally. It's not published on NPM, it's not gonna be published, but uh, this is just to uh, help debug and use uh, from the start. And I'm gonna have uh, Visual Studio Code open with um, this directory here. Sorry, I did not practice. I'm a not. I'm really bad at doing these presentations. I did not practice this before. Um, if there is a bug, I blame the computer. So as I said, uh, so this is an example of like I ported two uh, schematics from the CLI. These are the same schematics that we use in the CLI. Uh, these are the same blueprints, but that has been transformed into schematics from the CLI. There is the Angular app, which creates an Angular application. There you go. That should be way better. Uh, there is an Angular app that creates an Angular application. Uh, when you do ng-new, that's what it does. And there is a component when you do um, ng-generate component. Um, and so these are inside a collection and the description of that collection is basically, like I said, a uh, list of map from a name to a uh, to a bunch of things that describe the schematic. In this case, the factory, which is the code 
that generates the rule, uh, the schema, which is the JSON schema that validates the inputs, and the description of the, uh, of the schematics itself. And so we named that schematic Angular app. Uh, so if I go back here, and I do ng, no, not ng, uh, schematics, Angular app with my name and my source there and everything. So it creates a bunch of things. And if I look here, I have that bunch of thing existing. So this is the same template as Angular application. Uh, one thing that's interesting is that because it's descriptive, uh, if there is an error that comes in, it's just gonna tell me that there is an error. So if I do this again, it's gonna tell me like, oh, these files already exist. That's an error because you're trying to create them from nothing. Um, and even if I like remove like pslint.json, you'll see that it would try to, uh, it's not gonna complain about pslint.json existing, but it's still not gonna do anything. ps.json, pslint.json, it isn't there right now. Um, so to, to check a little bit, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have another, we're gonna add another uh, schematic here that has the factory, which is the actual code that generates the stuff that we're gonna call test, uh, which is a description. Look, mom, I'm on meetup. And no schema, because we don't need a schema right now. And we're gonna create a file uh, that we're gonna name test.ps, which is gonna be a TypeScript. We're gonna import rule uh, from at angular slash schematics. And we're gonna do export default function with options, which is the input that we get. This return a rule and the rule is, like I said, uh, it gets a tree and it return a tree. So as you can see, this, this doesn't do actually anything because um, we, we don't do anything, but we could have a create file which we're gonna name options.path and the content of that file is gonna be hello world. Option in this case, we probably want it. So what the default schematic, what the default schematic uh, CLI does is take all the options from the um, from the command line. So if I if I do test um, dash dash sorry path equal abc, well no um, hi just hi. So what it's going to do is it's going to create a file named hi and of course. That file contains hello world. Um, we could overwrite stuff, we could read stuff. So read takes, of course, a path. So let's um, let's read, I don't know, a small file, psconfig.json. So we could console.log that. And that's gonna read the file that already exists uh, and show us the output as a buffer. But Okay, um, this is not really, like this is useful, but it's not really great. Uh, what we probably wanna do is uh, start using some sources. So I'm gonna use a source that's called URL. Uh, URL as a source will, so we have basic rules here that are, for example, um, sorry, I'm gonna go here. Oh yeah, so we have a rule that's called merge with that takes as an input a, a source and the tree that's passed as a rule and then merge these two together as if they were one. So what, instead of returning this rule here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna merge with URL and then I'm gonna pass in uh, files and that's basically it. Uh, what files does is takes a bunch of files. So if I create a new folder here called file, and I create a new file here called mm, I again, 
and that files container URL. Well, I think you can guess what that, this is gonna do. So URL is gonna take files, create a bunch of actions from that uh, folder here. It's gonna create I again, and then it's gonna merge that with the tree, um, with the tree right outside. That, that comes in, the file system that comes in, sorry. And as you can see, this works. Um, so there is a bunch of those. Uh, one of them is, there is a bunch of like functions that exist again, uh, that exists already that we provide for you. One of it is apply, which takes a source and a list of rules. And one rule is move, for example. And uh, you can move those into a subdirectory. So here what it's gonna do is gonna take the source here, it's gonna generate it, and then it's gonna apply those rule one by one, and I'm missing a parentheses. And what this rule does is take a tree and move the entirety of the tree under a folder. Uh, so let's do that again. That slash d slash f is invalid. Uh, MD, there you go. And if I run that again, it's gonna do the same error exists. Something that's interesting here, if, if I do this, this should work. Um, without changing, without changing my, um, my schematics, because everything is descriptive, I can dry run and it's, got, it's not gonna create anything at all. The folder A is under D is, doesn't exist. And that's, without even changing that, I can create like complex schematics and we'll see in a bit how complex those schematics can be. And basically, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing in there that, um, uh, dry run will always be supported. So if we create it, and we try to create it again, it's gonna error out because it's trying to create a file that already exists. The dry run is gonna error out as well. But what's interesting is that I can also like force it. So again, without changing my schematics, I support all these options uh, where I basically create it again. But the, the interesting thing is that I didn't actually create it because I was dry running. But if I do this, it's gonna work again. Um, so, if we go to the Angular app, we'll see that uh, this is basically a little bit like we did. It's merge with apply of the URL of files, and it applies a template, uh, which is basically a little bit like Lodash templates, uh, which replace certain placeholder like path, for example, with the content of the input. And another example that I'm trying to find is uh, app module. Uh, yeah, so it supports a uh, structure like if else, for loops, and uh, other structure like that. It's a simple templating language. So we could use that in our thing. So uh, if we use name and we do template, so let's import it from um, schematics. And we pass options as the input of templates. Um, and we move it, well, we don't move it, but. So what this is gonna be is, um, so if we pass name equal my name, we'll see that the, the file already exists, so we'll just force it a little bit. And if we do I again, we see that my name is here. So it's a simple and a template in language that you can use in the code itself to, uh, in every file that, in every text file basically is gonna be interpreted with a low dash template kind of syntax. Um, another thing that we can do is create a use, uh, use schematics internally. And uh, this is gonna be my, a little bit of my last trick before I pass on to the next topic. But, um, so if we wanna use a component, for example, we wanna create a component. So right now, schematics component kind of run. It's gonna create a bunch of file and update the, uh, and update the app module so that the, the component is important by default. 
of course, everything was dry run. So if I do, if I remove dry run, that's gonna do, that's gonna do it. But if I dry run again, something that you'll notice is that it would create those file again, it would overwrite them, but it would not update the app module because the content did not actually change. Um, so let's say we want to have our test, um, our test component be, um, a, I apply, I create three components. So chain takes a rule, a list of rules, and then compose them one after the other. So it applies the first one and then apply the second one on the output of the first one. So schematics are composable and schematics are rules. So schematics with uh, the schematics component and we probably want to have, as, as the input of that component schematics, we probably want to have name component one. Oops. So if I do test again and I do dry run, it's gonna fail probably because the files already exist or something else happened. Schematics. Function. That's an interesting one. Oh, it's, uh, sorry. Apparently it's not rule. Because it's a schematic. Grammar is hard. So yeah, so, so I was, uh, as I was saying, component one already exists, so it wouldn't create it, right? Um, and if we force it, then it's gonna create it properly. It's not gonna update the app module. Um, so if we create another component that's component two, um, it would up, then it would update the app module because the content will change. There is the component two to add to it. Of course, we didn't do anything. Let's just create a git init, a git commit. So, and if I run it with um, git ops dry run, go, and then git diff will show that the update, that it's been inserted at the right place in the right app module. Um, so that's that's actually about it for uh, for schematics, for a short, a short introduction to schematics. Uh, the next step for us is gonna be, uh, of course, like integrating it with the Angular CLI, uh, so that you guys can start using your own generators in your own uh, in your own projects. Um, and then once uh, once that's integrated into the CLI, uh, as far as features go, uh, what's missing from here is uh, the concept of running uh, external tools. Uh, so external tools are a little bit touchy, so we're still in design phase for that because we want to keep a kind of concept that. Um, unless something is actually wrong, we're not gonna, uh, uh, unless something is wrong, we're not gonna stop the process, so we wouldn't change your file system. And we're using external tools, it's impossible, so we're making concessions there, but we'll design, we're designing the feature so that you guys can call, can call like npm install, for example, uh, from a schematics, or git init, or other tools like that. Create an issue on GitHub is something that we, that came up. Um, and uh, the, another feature that are coming, um, well, more, uh, more functionality for you. Um, we're talking debugging, because right now the debugging, so if I wanna debug this, what I can do is I can create a rule in the middle that, you know, console.log uh, tree.files, which is all the files, uh, return tree. So I could use that twice and then I would see what, what is in the first one. 
what is the second one that's kind of not really nice kind of API so you as you can see you know it shows what's in there but that's not that's not a proper debugging story so we want to really improve the debugging story uh, the ability to make it easier for people to uh, show up a graph of the actual file system at any steps um, and putting breakpoints into your code so that you can see what's going on there um, and um, uh, one of the other features that we're going to work on uh, almost right away is uh, interactivity so that you can uh, dictate like prompts for certain options as input and that your users can actually file them uh, fill them and of course support for a batch mode where um, all the default answers will be used instead of asking the users um, that's uh, that's basically it for an introduction to uh, schematics Stay tuned for the integration into the CI. Cool. Okay, thanks, Hans. I'm gonna bring up Oswaldo, and you can do. He's going to do a talk on deep learning and Angular, and I'm not even gonna try to introduce that. You just need to take that away for yourself. As soon as I start talking, there we go. Very good. And I'll just gotta do this. It's always it's always backward from. I know. Yeah. Great. Is that oh, a little bit bigger? Please here. welcome as well then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I always go through this resizing exercise. <clears throat> um, let me see. All right. Hello, everybody. It's good to be here. And uh, I guess I should start by asking how many people have worked with, done, have some exposure with deep learning? Okay, good. Um, actually, this is intended mainly for people who haven't seen it before. And so uh, how many people here today went to the uh, meetup last week? <coughs> okay, so new audience, great. Uh, you're probably wondering what's up with the deep learning stuff. And I'm still learning myself, but I, I'm really amazed with what it can do. And what I'm gonna do is give you uh, an overview of some of the concepts. <clears throat> and I'm gonna skip some slides but it'll be posted online and then you can look at them in more detail. And so I'll be pointing out the things that you'll need to delve into in more detail on your own. And that way you'll get sort of an idea of how it all works. And so <laughs> starting with this, it's, uh, we're not gonna look at the stuff on the left. We're gonna focus on the stuff that's on the red dot. And as you can see, Basically, it's a artificial intelligence, kind of like the umbrella. And then within that, there's machine learning. And then within that, there's uh, our, our deep learning. One thing I found kind of interesting, can everybody see this, by the way? 
I want to make, uh, let's see, actually, I'm just going to do this because I want to be able to, does that help? I, I like being able to flip back and forth, but maybe. No. You're the AV guy. No, no, I'm just, I'm just an AV guy. Of course I made it worse. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you let me touch it? Sorry, let it act first. There you go. Oh, oh, there you go. Go away. Still. Oh, you know what you need? Yeah. Ah, there we go. Good job. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So, you can't really maybe see it completely, but I just wanted to show you this because this is the Gartner curve. Oops. It's, um, yuck. Let me get this. Just trying to slide it just a bit. Anyway, so the interesting thing is the Gartner curve for last year doesn't have deep learning on it. I thought that was kind of peculiar, but I imagine probably this year that they are going to include it and given everything that's been happening. So this is a little bit of the kind of the elephant in the room a little bit uh, in terms of what AI has, there has been an impact and the one you probably know about is the self-driving trucks and all of this, the things that people are saying why we should go that direction and of course there's going to be an impact uh, on quite a few people um, i don't want to belabor this uh, but that's just one thing kind of fyi so the thing that you can kind of take away from this is generally speaking the uh, AI and, and machine learning and deep learning kind of started in the 50s, more or less. There was stuff before and, and around that time period. And the uh, one of the few dates that's actually specific is 1956. There was a conference at Dartmouth with six scientists. One was John McCarthy, the guy who invented LISP. And um, Marvin Minsky was there, one of the giants from uh, MIT. There was a guy by the name of Claude Shannon. Does anybody know? Remember him? He wrote this very seminal paper, I think it was in 1949, in terms of the frequency of signals that you need in order to be able to decode them. I think it was, is either 8K or 4K. So at that er period of time, again, there was work done by someone, I forgot his name, but he created a system for playing checkers with machine learning. Then there was something called the perceptron, which is like a little circle you may have seen it with the little vertical bar and the lines coming in, and then there's a function coming out. It's sort of simulating a neuron. That was actually a little bit earlier in the 40s, but that's kind of the foundation of, uh, 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 excuse me, of deep learning. And there was also Alan Turing. Everybody remember him? Yeah, so he was talking about learning machines, which I think got kind of inverted and became machine learning. I'm not really sure. But he had his finger in the pie of a lot of different things. So one of the things that about traditional AI is, um, well, first of all, when I talked to people who were from the 70s who were doing AI, I thought it was kind of boring. And I never heard anybody talking about things like uh, neural networks and all that stuff that was actually happening, or happening around that period of time. But if you were to take one word to describe um, traditional artificial intelligence, it would be rules so you get these rules and conditional logic and then you create a kind of a tree of structure of types and subtypes and it was typically like a mammal and you think and feed it with some data and then you go well is this thing a mammal or not and usually it was written in lisp thanks to john mccarthy probably and then probably most people here don't remember this but then people would rewrite it in another language called prologue totally completely useless for us doesn't <laughs> you're not going to see any of that stuff. However, one of the things about AI with the traditional stuff, these expert systems that came out in the 80s were actually quite good. 
they surpassed human capacity a lot of times in the medical field. Now we're kind of obviously moved away from that, but they did have it serve their purpose. On the other hand, machine learning and uh, deep learning are focused, if you were to pick one word, on data, tons of data, algorithms, optimization. This is going on in the 60s, 70s, and so forth. Then later, a little bit later on, around the 80s, all the stuff I'm going to talk to you about tonight was all done by then. So one of the giants of deep learning, his name is Jan LeCun, L-E-C-U-N, was working with convolutional neural networks, back propagation, activation functions, gradient descent, all that stuff. The problem was there wasn't enough horsepower. So basically they were useless. There was no way to really do anything because if it took a week to run something, it was impractical. So it was kind of a fringe thing that people were working on, but they were definitely making progress. So kind of talked about that, a little bit about that. So the big bang for AI, actually for deep learning, probably no one heard of it, 2009. That was with NVIDIA with the GPUs. That kind of helped things along a little bit better. Things got, took a little bit less, instead of a week, maybe two days, so still under the radar for the most part. And uh, then, before I get into this, what was it that really made it take off? Three things. Lots and lots of computing horsepower, relatively inexpensive, tons of data, and improved algorithms. Just as a side point, there was actually a, a Marvin Minsky proved that you couldn't solve the XOR problem. Do you know, you know the XOR, logical XOR? You couldn't do it with a one layer neural network. So AI took a hit. This is back around the 50s, 60s. So it was a legitimate reason. He actually proved that. It wasn't like he was had a bad attitude. So now, of course, we got a lot better systems. And then still, I haven't told you what, a, what a deep learning is yet, but it involves a neural network. I'm gonna skip forward here to Okay, it's gonna have an input on the left, output on the right. The stuff in the middle, they're called hidden layers. Now, what does that mean? It sounds like it's something strange and mystical. It's not. Just some intermediate layers for calculations. That's it. So the question of how many of these that you put in and this and that, we'll talk about that a little bit later, is called a hyperparameter. So when there's two or more hidden layers, that is deep learning. Kind of anticlimactic, I thought it would be like dozens, two. And they couldn't do anything beyond that in the 80s. Then somebody said, if there's more than 10, that's very deep learning, great. So in 2011, guess what? Somebody put together something with six hidden layers, wow. But not beyond that, too complicated, too much horsepower. Then things started to kind of heat up a little bit. 2012, there was a competition. 150 hidden layers. I think it was uh, Jeffrey Hinton. They won a competition. Shortly after that, Microsoft put together this network with over a thousand hidden layers. I think that's amazing. And still we didn't hear about it. When did it really take off? When did it become sort of the public became more in why you're here today? Because like, what's up with that? Was AlphaGo. By the way, they just beat the second guy who was the best of the best. I forgot his name, not, not Ledun, Sidun is another guy. And also with translation. The translation stuff, Google Translate was done with the rules and basically keywords. And how much can you do with that? The system got very complex. It was like, if, you, if somebody came up with a 2% improvement in accuracy, reduction of errors, like break out the champagne, we're all having a party. They started using deep learning. You won't believe this, I was stunned. 50% improvement overnight, deep learning. So now I started getting into the psyche a little bit. All right, so those are some of the differences. Let's look at uh, some of the similarities. They all use a model. Whether you're in science or whether you're in AI, there's a model. And what do you want with the model? You want it to be a good approximation to whatever system you're modeling, and you want it to be this prediction capability to be good as well. That's the general sort of sense of it. So let's start with something very simple. We'll take a bottle, generalize it, then we'll see how it applies to deep learning. 
So I have to ask you this. How many people are familiar with linear regression? About a quarter. And for those of you who are not, do you remember the equation y equals m times x plus b? Do you, sort of, kind of, no? It's a line in the Euclidean plane. And what you do with that, there it is, there it's sort of fitting some points. Obviously, there's a lot of exceptions where it won't fit if it looks like a parabola or a cubic, so on and so forth. But if it kind of has that sort of cigar-like shape like that, you try to fit it with the line and say, this is the best fitting line to not only model the system, but to make approximations, estimates, predictions. So what does it mean to say that the line is the best fit? What you do is you try to minimize the error, the sort of, quote, deviation from the line from the points and try to minimize that. So what you do is for each of these points here, you take the y value and then the, of the point and then what the y value would be if it was on the line, take that quantity, square it so nothing's negative, add them all up, divide by the number of points, and then the two, divide by two is just a convenience factor. That's what you gotta minimize. That's a function of m and b. So it's a sort of 3D shape, this, this uh, uh, cost function, error function, lots of different names. That's the thing you're trying to minimize. If you remember from calculus, you need to take the derivative. But since it's a function of two variables, you take the derivative with respect to m, set it equal to zero, through partial derivative with respect to b, set it equal to zero, solve. Turns out that m is just the average of the x values, the mean. And b is, also has a closed form solution. So you're done, kind of. So as an example, what if you had the horizontal axis is the height and the vertical axis is the people's weight? That would kind of sort of probably fit this kind of line somehow or another. What if you had horizontal axis is the number of square feet and the vertical is the cost of the house? Kind of, sort of, but you're probably thinking that's a very, very lame, limited approximation because there are a lot of other factors, right? Not just square feet. So here's where we generalize. Those factors right there, at least, that's gonna be an improvement. So now that y equals mx plus b becomes this y equals w1x plus w2x2 wnxn plus b. So the w's are like the m, they're the unknowns, and the x1 to xn, those are the things that we have up here, like that. That makes sense? That's the first generalization. Keep that thought in mind. So now, we're back to this neural network. So what happens? The stuff on the left, those are the x1 to xn. Typically, you know, like from a spreadsheet, so you have a bunch of rows, and then at the end, you'll have the actual value, the, 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 the known cost. That's called supervised learning. If you don't know the cost, that's unsupervised. There's also something called reinforcement learning. That's when you hear about these neural networks playing Atari games and getting better and playing Go and all that stuff. That's reinforcement learning. That's not deep learning. We won't go through that. So what happens now is that you see that neuron right there? What's the number coming into that? Well, it's gonna be this x1 times whatever that weight is, x2 times that weight, x3, blah, blah, blah. So it's gonna be that equation again. I didn't tell you what the weights are in that neural network. That's a topic unto itself. For us, what it will suffice is assign small random values between zero, or between negative one and one. So that's one big thing to take care of. Now, we have all these equations here, guess what? We use a matrix. So we have a matrix to represent all these things that is a nice compact form. So now what happens? We have a matrix from the input to this row, this or rather this layer, and from this layer to this layer is another matrix, and from this one to this one, great. However, this is what's known as a linear system, which means we can multiply all the matrices together, get one matrix, collapse the whole thing into the input and the output. In order to prevent that, that's where these activation functions come in. 
There's three main types, sigmoid, hyperbolic tangent, and rel u, which is rectified linear unit. Before getting into the details, does anybody remember the uh, Euler constant? 2.7, 1, 8, 2, 8, and so forth. Remember log, natural log, base e, same. So when you take the function y equals e to the x, you take the derivative, it's the same, which is unique among non-zero differentiable functions. Sigmoid function is, very simple, the ratio of e to the x in the numerator and then e to the x plus one in the denominator. That gives you a number between zero and one. It's going to be always um, increasing, it's differentiable and nice smooth function. Hyperbolic tangent, spelled T-A-N-H, pronounced than by mathematicians, like thank you, is another ratio where you're gonna have e to the x, e to the negative x, top and bottom, and the top is a minus, the bottom is a plus. So it goes from negative one to one. Rel u is interesting because that is the maximum of zero and x. So here you are on the negative x-axis, moving to the right, it's zero, it's zero, it's zero. And then at the origin, it goes up, it's the identity. So if you go up to six and you go across, that's rel u six, that's in TensorFlow. All these are in TensorFlow as well. And so that point there at zero, it's continuous but not differentiable. So what some people do is they say, well, let's take this exponential part here to smooth it out, called ELU, also in TensorFlow. Some have taken that, instead of a, making it exponential, they take the line instead of the x-axis, they drop it down a little bit, just a little. And what you'll read a lot of times, most of the time, is that it's a little negative uh, slope. It's wrong. It's actually a small positive uh, slope. It just seems to have propagated, oops, propagated through a lot of these uh, blog posts, you know, copy paste. So now that we have these, we can go across, we can use pretty much the same activation function. We take the inputs, do the matrix thing, then this activation thing. Then we get to the end for simplicity. Let's just assume that it all comes out to one point. So you have this number and you've got the array, your spreadsheet, it's gonna have the actual cost of the house. Are they gonna be the same or different? They gotta be different, right? Because the numbers are random. I mean, how could it be the same? This is a key part. What happens then, you take the difference between the outputted value and the one that's on your spreadsheet. That difference is the error. What you do is you go back to the previous layer, so this one, and assign the error that's proportionate to the amount of the contribution of each node. What does that mean? So in the previous layer, you have one node that contributed 50% to the output. It gets 50% of the error and so forth. Very simple arithmetic. At the same time, there's this cost function on the side, which I haven't told you how to do because it's, again, heuristics. You take the partial derivative. It's a product chain really thing, not to worry too much about the details. And you compute this number. That number is what you use to update the weights of these guys right over here. See, so all these, finger flutter, all these weights get updated. There's another thing in front of that product, it's called alpha, that's called the learning rate. So that's the hyperparameter that you set outside before you train the network. Hyperparameters are things that like the, 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 the knobs and dials and stuff that you set up that you can't uh, uh, learn internally. So you set them up. And the learning rate is typically between 0 0.1 and 0 0.001. So one one hundredth, one tenth, and one one, one thousandth. Okay, so now you go all the way back. Going to, from left to right is forward propagation. Going from right to left is backward error propagation or back prop. You repeat that process with every row in your spreadsheet until you run out of data or the error reduces to under a pre-specified value set by you. That, if you have at least two hidden layers, deep learning. Pause for a few moments to absorb the impact of that information. All right, so now that you know that, this is more just the equations. And let me take a quick look, where am I at? I can't see, okay. So, blah, blah, blah. Oh, look at this, see, in Python, 
look at this. Oh, by the way, e to the x over e to the x plus one, usually they divide by e to the x. So it becomes one over one plus e to the negative x. It's the same, but it's more intuitive the other approach. But anyway, you see right here, look at this, Python sigmoid. One over one plus nx dot product negative because it's the matrix there. Tan h, look at there, rel u max. So they're already showing up in, um, in Python. And so the oldest one, did I already mention that? It used to be sigmoid, that was the thing. Then forget about that. Now let's do hyperbolic tangent. Now forget about that. Now let's do rel u. So that's the, the thing that you tend to see in a lot of neural networks. This is a sample cost function. This is the one when we had the two variables, the line, and see how nice it is? Smooth, symmetric, nice, this is convex. It doesn't have any dips inside, so you don't get something like this. That's where you get problems, because if you're at a relative maximum, minimum, or at a saddle point, you're not at the minimum. How do you get from where you are to that? You're like, you're in the jungle. It's dark, you can't see. You're sort of, there's, you're at some minimum point, but is it the global? Uh, now, sometimes what you can do is you can say, well, I'm at a relative minimum, but it's close enough. That's another heuristic, depending on the problem that you're working on. How to select a cost function. This may not make sense completely, but remember I said there's supervised learning and unsupervised learning, the difference, that's part of it. The activation function, I showed you those three, and there's other factors. I got a little too hand wavy. Thank you. I had to give you something to do. So. Okay. Great. All right. So I'm going to speed this up. So when you're on this cost function, the general technique is gradient descent. Gradient means tangent, normal means perpendicular. So you're, think about this, you're at the top of the mountain with your skis on, I did this once, and you look down and I said, can I go that way over there? No, you go that way. I said, that's too steep, because that's the fastest way down. That's what gradient descent is. It's kind of like a greedy algorithm. So. There's stochastic and there's the regular one, whether it's you do a subset or all of them, depending on the size of the data. Again, heuristics, and you gotta figure that out when you're working on your problem. So I mentioned hyperparameters and the number of layers in the neural network. How many layers? That's the first question that almost everybody asks. I know I did too, I couldn't find an answer. How many layers, how many neurons? Well, let's take a look. Jeffrey Hinton, one of the gods of deep learning, and Yoshua Benjo, this is what they say. You just add layers till you overfit, and then you start dropping out. Great, what if you don't know what overfitting is, <laughs> what dropout is? Dropout's interesting. Some of the stuff that happens is counterintuitive. You think this could never work, but it does. So Jeffrey Hinton in 2012, with the 150 layers, introduce this concept of dropout rate where you just randomly drop nodes. It sounds crazy, but it works. That's what he started. He's quite an amazing guy. This is when you have like 10,000 columns of data and a billion rows, you know, so that's like 10 trillion. You know, you can drop 20% or so randomly. It's probably not gonna hurt. You're not gonna see it either. So it's sort of in a weirdly twisted way is logically, illogically logical, something like that. So there's the other one about the, um, the number of nodes, use cases, CNNs, good for image processing, they're stateless. RNNs, good for NLP, where you gotta keep track of information over a period of time, it's stateful, they're much more complex. CNNs, they involve these little things, these little matrices called uh, filters. Has anyone heard of a convolution? So convolution, remember Dr. McCoy when he's scanning the person's body, had that little thing scanning across with that sort of space age zone? That's what it reminds me of. You have an image in front of you and you start, you move this thing across in a three by three and you compute the product of these relative terms, positional, and then you add it and you move it to another spot. Do that all the way across, you get another array, 
pretty much the same size. Then you do something typically, two by two, you take the biggest number out and that reduces it to a smaller image. That's called a feature map. One thing about deep learning is it does the feature detection for you. This is the beauty of it. Whereas in machine learning, you're gonna be more involved in that process. So just kind of keep that in mind. So you do this thing and then by, by um, taking the biggest of the four, that's called the max pooling. I don't know where that term came from. But then you have uh, ReLU. So you do this convolutional thing, the filters, then you do a ReLU, then you do a max pool, do that a couple of times. And at the end, you'll have, for example, 10 digits represented that you wanna see which one is in that image. You do a fully connected layer. So every one of those nodes at the end gets connected to everything and all these feature maps. There can be hundreds of them, it's massive. And then at the end, you take this thing called a soft max. It's kind of another activation type thing. And the numbers that you get at the end add up to one. So there's gonna be a spot there that's gonna be like, I don't know, 0.8. So you say, it's a three. That's convolutional neural networks in a nutshell. And so this is kind of the image there. You see how I, was, I couldn't find the one that I really liked. Yeah, these ones are all, the ones I found were all inadequate. So, but this is the best of the lot. So, you know, just look around to fill in the one that you like. So with RNNs, the darling of them all is LSTM. That was used in AlphaGo with some other twists to it. And it's, they're harder to train. There's a lot more work involved because they're more complicated. And in fact, that's what's inside an LSTM. I saw that the first five times I saw it, I got a headache. Like, I'm not a hardware person. What does this mean? Sigma is the sigmoid, 10H, like before. So what happens is you take the current value, the new value comes along, you keep the old value, but you forget some stuff and you remember some stuff and here's the equations. I kind of pretty much understand the equations. I still don't understand why it works. What happens, the good part, all of this stuff with the LSTM, with these gates and stuff, it's all done for you by deep learning. Thank goodness. I sure don't want to mess with that. Here's an even better headache diagram. Look at all that stuff. Does anybody like this kind of diagram with all of these knobs and switches? And Okay, well, you know, we're all in it together, I guess. So here's an example from Keras, just to show you very simply, a snippet when you do the imports. This is in Python, of course. You see that there, import LSTM. You're almost done, you're halfway there practically. So all of this stuff is managed for you. If you don't wanna get into the guts of these things, you don't have to. If you're gonna be doing algorithms, new inventive uh, neural networks and so forth, you might have to be a little bit more aware of some of that stuff and the details. So here's another one. Look at the thing on the left and the thing on the right. They look the same, right? Panda. Oh, but look at the percentage, 57 on the left. Oh, and then 99% confidence that the one on the right is a gibbon. Welcome to Generative Adversarial Networks by Ian Goodfellow, another total brainiac, started three years ago for the purpose of creating synthetic data so that you have a small amount of data and you generate some similar stuff. And so you don't have to, you don't have to carry gigabytes maybe hundreds of megabytes. However, there's this part right here where you can't visually tell the difference. Apparently there are 10 techniques to defend against this. And then two weeks ago, Ian tweeted that a couple of guys came up with a system that they bypassed all 10 of those defenses. So it's kind of like working with viruses, some kind of maybe, I don't know. Uh, Jan LeCun said this is the most important thing since sliced bread in deep learning. So they know more than I do. And that's a little bit of a description of that. I'm racing forward. The net, the, um, as far as the frameworks, we all know TensorFlow is getting all the love. However, the ones that I've highlighted in blue, I've heard good things about, I've read good things about them. Some people say that they're better, easier to work with in TensorFlow. Uh, certainly Keras is a, a layer of abstraction above, it is easier. So if you're thinking of starting, but you don't wanna go slog through everything, it may be worth your while to uh, look at Keras which has good integration with uh, TensorFlow. And languages are Python and R. 
uh, for the most part. Java and C++ are supported, but the support is lagging, unless you go to Deep Learning for J, total Java stack, and that way they avoid the conversion of data between Python and Java, which is kind of slow, it's a bottleneck. So they're avoiding that. They're more enterprisey. And uh, some of these, I'll skip over these things. I'm gonna skip that too, we don't have enough time. Just wanna show you what does this, what's the conclusion of all this? I'm gonna show you right now. If I can find this. Okay, the TensorFlow playground is this. If you go, the, it's a web page, obviously. So I don't know if you can't really see it very well, but you see this part right here, the learning rate? We talked about that. You see this here, this activation? You see those three functions? We talked about that too. So now you have a start. And then here you can add more, you can add more nodes, oh, it's offline. You can add layers, you can add nodes and different things for inputs and tweak it and mess around with it, all right? So what I did was I found this person who wrote a, the uh, converted it to TypeScript. So I went, aha, I'm going to take this and tweak it. Oops. Let me see, I did the wrong. Okay, just so you know, I'm not faking it. So I created this project by taking that guy's stuff, which he used uh, NP install and so forth. Um, I took the TypeScript files from his source directory, copied it into the project that I created. I took the two package JSON files, merged them. The two index HTML files merged them because there's SVG and some other stuff. And then some of the files have D3, so you have to, you have to add a little extra stuff which I'll show you right here. These are his files. So you see he's got nn.ts, that's the neural network stuff. And notice here, you see this is a TypeScript. He's got 10h, he's got rel u, you've already seen that. Same definition. See the sigmoid? This is old hat for you now, right? You're bored with this. Okay, good. So that was his thing. If you, you can get it over, where did I put it? I think I skipped over it. So I had to do an install of D3 because that's not part of the standard install. And then those files there, I had to add this import star as D3 from D3. Kind of a late runtime binding thing, I guess. Whatever. And then ng serve. So notice over here, you're gonna go, I'm gonna go to this URL and then guess where I'm gonna go, local, you can't see it, but I can barely see it too. All right, see, same. So, so it took, what, 35, 40 minutes just to show you this. But if I would shown you this without showing you the other stuff, you'd be like, so what? What is this crap? More or less, same. So now that you've been so patient with all of this, here's the fun part. We can have fun, right? Can we? Okay, good. So this is kind of, I really like this. It's a website called deepart.io. I'm not an artist. So I had some SVG stuff with some JavaScript, generated some SVG, took a screenshot, PNGs, uploaded that, and some celebrities. It was like Friday night, two in the morning with a beer. So it was totally random, nothing, no particular order. So the stuff on the right is my stuff and then you all recognize this person? <laughs> yeah, you make me feel old, man. Thank you. Grace Jones. She was with the Schwarzenegger movies and all that. Anyway, so that's the convolution. It's a convolutional neural network, 19 hidden layers. And it's free. I'm, no, I'm not affiliated with anything I've mentioned tonight, but it just blends them together. It's kind of like, uh, what was that uh, program on the, 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 the app? Uh, not Snapchat, what's Instagram? On steroids to the 12th power on caffeine. It's just insane what you can do. It's far more than just applying a filter. So I did the obligatory cats, 
That took about three weeks before it came back. I don't know why. And then his purpleness, the one on the right, the middle, the left, it kind of looks sort of, I don't know, uh, Clint Eastwood. I don't know, just, is it just me or does he look more pissed off in life than he does in the generated image? By the way, he's coming back to acting. I heard that should be interesting. You're already Harry's grandfather on the loose. And then this one didn't work out too well. It was kind of, it was the clock, Salvador Dali, kind of lame looking. Um, we all know her. The weird part of this is that the eyes that are normal look weird. Sort of the inversion of, I don't know. And of course, Arnold, it's okay. This one I like, I don't know. It's kind of swirly, I don't know. So uh, now I get to the part where I'm supposed to do the obligatory shameless plug. A little bit of uh, training next month. I'm going to be doing some deep learning Angular stuff. Uh, deep, excuse me, deep learning TensorFlow and Keras. I do also do Android training in Angular. Some of the books, the, the Angular books coming out next month. It's going to be four. I think there's some 4.1. No 4.2. Missed it. Too bad. And that's all I had to say. Cool. So we probably got like 20 minutes. If anybody's got questions about anything either the speakers talked about uh, or just generic Angular questions, or if you want to hurl abuse at me, you can do that too. Uh, so if you have a question, whatever, raise your hand. Somebody will run over with a mic. And uh, do remember that if you do ask a question, you will be asked to sign a release because we are live streaming this all over the internet right now. So questions, comments, concerns? There's one over there, one, cool. Uh, Tanj, come into useful and, and run the, the microphone around if you would. Yes, so is using Python and SK Warren in terms of big data sets a something that can be scalable or if Dealing with very large data sets would be better to find to use another language or platform. That's that's what Deep Learning for J says that they solve that problem, and it's it's a very enterprisey solution, but <clears throat> um, one thing to, be, to keep an eye out, I, I don't know the exact answer. Um, I don't know what else you would have out there other than being in the cloud. I mean, you're gonna do some training in the cloud, of course. Uh, generally, what's gonna happen is you're gonna be using Python one way or the other for the most part, because the other languages don't have the libraries and the support. So there's a certain amount of, uh, uh, what would you call it? The performance is something that you sort of have to kind of deal with until the hardware gets better. Seems like the hardware is the solution. I may be wrong. Um, I haven't reached the stage that you're describing. So uh, the thing that you do want to avoid is if you're gonna use something with like Java and with Python, you want to avoid the bridge where you convert the data back and forth. That's a no-no. That's going to be a real performance problem. So at least you can avoid that. Sorry, I don't have a better answer. There's, yeah, just one, just, I get here. Hand that. You take the mic over there if you would. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I take the mic over there. Yes, sorry. I'm just going to give you orders and you're going to run around. <laughs> I'll give you a schematic to get over there. <laughs> um, I was just wondering uh, if you could talk about any 
story you guys have um, in relation to Web Components, Polymer 2, and Angular 4.2? How do they all fit together, if you have a story or something you can share? Uh, so in general, Angular uh, already supports consuming Web Components. So uh, in general, a Polymer component should just drop into an Angular app and work. Um, one of the things that today you have to do is you actually, because obviously we don't know any of the sort of static information we have about Angular components, so inputs and outputs and properties, uh, we don't have any way of understanding that on a Polymer component. So you sort of have to say, don't type check this component, and then you should be able to drop them in. I think in 4.1 or 4.2, we made a couple of tweaks to, to improve that interop. So being able to sort of interweave Angular to, or Angular and then a Polymer, and then an Angular and a Polymer, right? Um, so something we're definitely we're working on. In general, it works for most components, especially at the leaf node kind of level. So if you want to use a Polymer date picker inside of an Angular app, great. Um, but increasingly, we want to make sure that we we work with these standards wherever possible. So it's a thing that we are, we are very much keeping our eyes on and, and working towards. I guess it, we should say that a, an Angular component is not the same as a web component. They are not one-to-one -one today. Um, in general, that, that's a thing that we may or may not arrive to, but the, the consumption of them works absolutely fine. Um, and you can absolutely, if you wish, if it's something you wanted to do, uh, you could wrap up an Angular component in a custom element in a web component, and that works absolutely fine. We actually added an API in 4.2 that makes that a little bit easier. You can just say, bootstrap this component onto this element, and you could hand it a web component and wire everything up, and, and that would be fine as well. And if that's something you want to chat about afterwards, come and find me. I can I could blab on for like an hour about that, so I'll just stop talking. Other questions? Really? No questions? One, there you go. <laughs> That's why you're not developer relations, Hans. <laughs> Sorry to make you walk for so long. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, the question is on schematics. So what, uh, I mean, I understood like 60, 70% of your talk. Uh, what What is it that I'm not getting in Angular CLI today that I will get, in, get by using schematics? I understood that the, it, I could use that for code generation. Mm -hmm. um, so is that something? Uh, is that something that that that's the only thing that it's going to give me? And and when when is it go, when is go, when is it going to be available? And uh, like how how do I make use of it? Like I can answer that yeah, using the same mic. Actually, I'm really good like that. Um, so the first question was, what do you get from schematics that you don't get currently from CLI, right? Uh, so what you will get is a custom template. So right now, uh, when you generate stuff with Angular, you only get uh, to generate like components, services, pipes, a new application. Um, there's a bunch I'm missing, but you know we have a set list of stuff that you cannot generate anything else. Uh, so what you're going to get is that you're going to be able to generate like ng generate uh, my component or a page or a route that uh, either you or somebody else provided for you. So you'll be able to install like npm install, you know, uh, John Papa's templates or Ionic templates. And uh, while well, sup uh, supposing that those exist, uh, you can just like ng, ng generate Ionic page and it will generate the page um, using the system. So it's a, it's a little bit like merging Yeoman with schematics, uh, with the Angular CLI, sorry. And you could one big case for that is you could do the same thing for your own company and have you know if you've got a set of style guides or templates or standard things you do across a large organization, then schematics would let you do that right build a standard set of templates for your own company's style guide your own company's you know the way that you write components whatever you do and create your own set of generators to do that. Yeah, um, and uh, since those are going to be reusable, like uh, if you want to create uh, if you want to create um, like your own component, but you want to modify a little bit our template. If you use our template, then we improve it later on because I don't know, new features in Angular that we want to take advantage of, uh, then you can still do that. Uh, you, you, you're you going to get the advantages right away without having to wait for, uh, without having to integrate it into your own templates. Uh, the, uh, the second question I think was, um, 
when is it going to be available? Was that the second question? Yes. And uh, the answer to that is I am forbidden by my director to speak about any uh, timeline because um, not, not, not just everyone, but also me, we're guilty of overpromising on times. And it's just like, yeah, well, the, the truth is as soon as it's ready. And um, this so can is- Can I ask like a month, a year, a decade? So I would say definitely more closer to a month than a year, but between a year and uh, between a month and a quarter, it's going to be I don't know. Okay, that's all. It's, um, that's so the code is ready, um, but like we need to publish it to npm. Uh, the Angular team has like a higher standard of uh, of like publishing than just like making it work. So there is like a missing missing test, missing like. A bunch of other things that we require to publish it, and then once it's on npm, you guys are going to be able to start uh, using it. And the next step is going to be integrating into this in uh, the Angular CLI, uh, which is actually which is going to be relatively simple. Uh, the most complex part of integrating with the CLI will be to move our current set of uh, blueprints over to schematics. One of the just one of the things we we don't usually talk about, but we should mention the schematics. Um, you ask what you get, which is a fair question, but one of the things that we get as the team is that it, this is probably the first, one of the first tools we're designing to work the same, exactly the same inside and outside of Google. A lot of the tooling that you use in the CLI is very distinct and very different from the tooling we use inside of Google because we have an entirely different set of build tooling, right? Um, and that's a lot of work for Hans to maintain on the public side. It's a lot of work for the internal team to maintain. And you know, we get regressions and bugs from different versions of things. So schematics is, is first of hopefully many different pieces we're going to build that will be the, exactly the same code inside and outside of Google. And so it means that you're able to use the same tooling that we are. Uh, you'll get the improvements that internal Google teams suggest, and that feeds back to us as well. So as the open source does cool stuff with it, then obviously Googlers can benefit. Yeah, and to, to add on to that, uh, this is literally the first piece uh, from the Angular dev kit uh, that you might have heard if you uh, were following the Angular team for a while now. We've been talking about like what, what is going to be the next step for the CLI. Well, the Angular dev kit is that, and this is the first real step towards that uh, big goal of having like something that's extensible, something that people can actually develop against and for, and that uh, can fit your project rather than your project fitting it, which is really what we want to try to achieve at some point with the CLI. So this is the first big step for the dev kit itself. Um, I think you heard a third question in your, where can you find documentation? <laughs> That's why we haven't shipped it yet. <laughs> yeah. Have we shared the design doc? Is there a design doc? So there is a design doc, but it's outdated now because we faced some challenges during the implementation that we changed um in an agile way okay um where's the code loop so the code the code itself is on uh github angular uh, slash dev kit and inside of it there's going to be a bunch of different directories for a uh, different part of the code um uh, and there there is a readme too that has a bunch of documentation but i'm still actively writing it uh and there's going to be soon uh the wiki is going to have some documentation uh, that we follow, like we'll try to document as much as possible. And hopefully like in the future, I don't know why I can't say again uh, when, but that might be closer to a year than a month in this case. Uh, we'll have like schematics.angular.io that's gonna contain like a lot more documentation and maybe a playground or something like that. Bugs are not, are probably okay. Uh, feature requests are welcome if you guys want to go out and say like, oh, this doesn't support that. I'd like that. Um, it's always something that's always fun to discuss. Um, so yeah, uh, comments are welcome. Just file issues. Uh, issue number one was already filed, so you don't get to do that. You don't get to just do a first. <laughs> Other questions? Your one chance. Really? Really? Going once? Going twice? Okay, we're done. Thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, we'll be hanging around a little bit if you want to ask questions. A couple of us will be around, but uh, at some point you'll have to get out because we all like to go home to our families as well. Yes. Did we miss it? I apologize. Sit down. Everybody sit down and let's listen to this man's question. <laughs> you don't have to sit down, but if you'd like to sit down. 
One, two. Yeah, sorry. Uh, actually, actually, in that question, the I'm a the the uh, angular angular lever, <laughs> and I'm a the decentralized the application developer for the Ethereum blockchain network. The the actually the the blockchain uh, for the blockchain client, the single phase the application is really pierced well. So we are using the angular for the client side and and we had the the startup company the based on the uh san francisco and seoul that we are building the art stock the services the the art stock x.com is our the uh, company website and we are looking for a new developer the have the have who have experience in the developing the Angular framework. So, so I'm commanding this now. Thank you. Okay. So if you're looking for a job, go speak to that man. I'm not looking for a job yet. Not yet? Well, I never know after tonight, like. Depends how long schematics <laughs> take, I guess. So. Cool, thanks for coming everybody. Uh, we'll see you next month.